So the final part of my lectures on schools and schooling and tied to the sociology of education is to think about life in schools themselves. So, so far, we've talked a lot about sort of theories of schools, how schools are tied to stratification systems, how it is that social context like neighborhoods, poverty, segregation influence schools. Now I wanna sort of take a little bit of a deeper dive to look at what's happening in schools themselves and to think about um, schools as key sites of socialization that prepare people for particular roles in society or future positions within a society. Now, sometimes uh, we think about this as the hidden curriculum of school. And by hidden curriculum, what we mean are the sets of things that schools do that they don't really do explicitly, but they tend to do, or they tend to produce um, anyway. So this is the question of like, what else do students learn in school? So, you know, think about it for a moment. Like, what have you learned in school? What were your experiences in school? Now, one of the things that you learned in school was likely math and science and languages. So English, um, uh, social studies, the history of your country, um, things like that. And these are taught explicitly, often through textbooks, with very particular curriculum that you're expected to learn. And you may even have to take statewide or national tests to make sure that your school is doing a good job in conveying this explicit curriculum. The hidden curriculum of school is, it refers to the things that you learn in school about your society, about your place in the world, about who you are and what other people are like, about power, about authority. All of these lessons are taught not explicitly, but subtly through things like the arrangement of classroom space, rules and routines, and how students are spoken to um, uh, by other students and by teachers. So here, you know, um, you see the organization, a picture of an organization of a classroom. And um, this classroom is very hierarchically organized. And how do I know that or why do I think that? Well, there's one person that really matters in the classroom where the seats look like this, and that is the teacher. Everybody's going to be looking straight ahead, forward. You can't really turn to your right or turn to your left to talk to someone. It would be very noticeable of the teacher, by the teacher. And you kind of look at the backs of other people's heads and try to look around them so that you can see the teacher. This conveys a lesson to students. It actually teaches them something. It tells them something. It says, you know, there's a person here who has absolute authority, and your purpose is to listen to that person. It is not to interact with one another. Now, this lesson is not hugely dramatic. There are ways to challenge it, of course. We shouldn't think of things as being so set in stone. But that certainly is the one of the lessons that you learn. Another lesson that you learn sometimes in schools is about the advantages of seniority. If you've been at school for a while, if you're in a more senior grade, you have more rights. You often have more things that you can do. We naturalize the idea of inequality within schools by showing that some people, seniors, get more stuff than other people. This is a lesson that we teach people. We say to them that it's legitimate that as people acquire status, they should get more things. Schools could be organized differently. They could have a different kind of hidden curriculum. They could say that as you, you know, acquire these additional positions, you don't get anything more than anybody else because we fundamentally believe in the equality of all students. That's not how they function. And so, um, and then you can think about like, what are legitimate rules for missing class? What are all of these things convey something, not in an official curriculum kind of way, but in a hidden way that teach us all what is valuable within a society. Now, one of the ways that also schools do this is to track students. What is tracking? Well, um, many of you have probably experienced it. Some of you may not have. Tracking is basically saying, 
there are different tracts. Oh, I shouldn't use that word, but it's basically the, the easiest word for me to think about, uh, to use in this context, or pathways that students end up upon. And as they end up in those pathways, it determines where they end up. And so here is an example of uh, different tracks of mathematics for people in high school in the United States. And so some will get algebra and then a continuation of algebra and then geometry and algebra two, whereas others will start with honors geometry and move to advanced calculus or more advanced calculus by their senior years. These tracking systems also are hidden curricula that convey to students who has skills and who doesn't have skills, who's smart and who's not, and you know, what smartness is, and you know, who often are seen as the most valuable students. Sociologists frequently study tracking because it has implications for long-term educational opportunities and is heavily tied to race and class. So um, African-American students and poorer students are disproportionately likely to be put into remedial or basic tracks. And so we're very interested in what that tracking does. And research has shown that students in the higher tracks generally have much richer educational experiences, putting them even further ahead. In contrast, teaching and learning in the lower tracks is often incredibly basic, not very interesting or engaging for students. And this leaves low track students even further behind. And so, you know, this shouldn't really be terribly surprising to you that like, you know, the teachers are much more excited to teach these sort of like more advanced tracts. Um, they see that as more valuable as a task that gets communicated to students. And so these tracking systems have deep implications for the social experience of students, the likelihood that people drop out and future educational opportunities. And advanced course taking and social class here, we see um, that students that are identified as academic take advanced math, science, science, and, soci so, uh, and social studies classes, whereas students who are not identified as academic don't. But we also know a huge difference between this and, and, and people's social class standing. So here um, uh, in, in the chart, what we see is students in the lowest fifth of um, uh, uh, the social class position. So this is the bottom 20%, this is 20 to 40% of earnings, and this is the top 20% um, uh, uh, of American families. And as you'll see, the, more, the wealthier students are, the more likely it is that they're going to be considered academic. So research has shown that poor and working class students are more likely to be placed in lower tracks than um, um, even controlling for their ability. What that means is that students of similar ability who are poor are more likely to be tracked into lower or more remedial tracks. So the same kind of student just because they're poor is more likely to be put into a remedial track. In many schools, this pattern means that upper tracks are almost all white and or middle class students, and the lower tracks are commonly low income and or students of color. And so what this means is that even in the same school, um, you can see patterns of segregation where middle class and typically whiter students are in the highest track and working class poor and or students of color are more likely to be in the lowest track. And this pattern we talk about as a second generation segregation because it means that even integrated schools can be segregated. Why? Because even when we integrate a school, one of the things that we do is we create different educational pathways for different kinds of students often tied to, in part, their class and race background. So integrated schools can themselves 
be segregated within the daily experience of being in that school. This is why we can't just look at a simple measure of like how segregated is the school overall. We also need to look at the tracks of that school and ask what are the tracks doing in terms of um, producing a second generation segregation or segregation where the school looks integrated, but it's far less likely to be so. I want to end with the discussion of how to improve schools and how to increase opportunity and what we know about that. Um, educational policy as an area of research refers to decisions about school issues, issues like funding and operations, testing and enrollment, and researchers work extensively on educational policies to ask how is it that we could restructure schools in order to provide greater opportunities for more people within a society. Sociologists are interested in educational policy because it speaks to questions of basic fairness in a society. I wanna take one step back here and just say that often we think about schools in a magical way. And what I mean by that, what I mean is that like we think about schools as magical institutions, which are places where somehow we can park kids for a period of time, you know, quarter of their waking hours, and make all the problems of a society go away. And so, you know, some of the deep challenges of schools have nothing to do with schools. They have to do with poverty, which exists outside of the context of the school walls. They have to do with racism, which exists in the school, but also outside of the school. They have to do with gender relations that can be deeply hostile to people with different gender identities. They have to do with social problems more generally. And we shouldn't think about schools as places that can just make all of those social problems disappear. And so some parts of school reform, some of the things that we might need to do to reform schools has nothing to do with schools. It has to do with the sets of pressures outside of the schools that are often producing effects also within the school. Now, educational policy in the United States is influenced by this long historical tradition where local communities have control over their schools. This picture here is of a little red schoolhouse and um, almost no one has gone to a little red schoolhouse, and yet it is a cultural trope that looms large in the American imagination of this space where young people go to this sort of single room school, this little red house, and towns or villages and the local people from those towns and villages would run their own schools, set their own curricula, hire teachers by themselves or fire them, and determine how much money to spend on schools and when schools would be. This was basically how education worked in the 18th and 19th century of the United States. The federal government, the, 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 the government in Washington, D.C., began to be much more engaged in schooling in the 20th century, in part um, um, through compulsory K through 12 education, and then really in the second half of the 20th century in relationship to segregation and to the problems of segregation and how it was that small local communities frequently segregated their schools. Now, the earlier part of the 20th century, um, when there was compulsory or much broad, broader based K through 12 education, is part of the reason behind the United States' economic dominance for much of the 20th century. We cannot understand the United States' economic position absent the relatively high degree of education that all Americans received. The rest of the world has pretty much caught up to the United States, but for a long period in time, the U.S. had an incredibly highly educated workforce. Um, that meant that almost everyone had graduated from high school and was literate. And the rest of the world was not like that. 
And this gave the United States a huge economic advantage. Having highly skilled workers, they're more productive, um, and that higher degree of productivity is going to create uh, likely economic growth. Um, and so this was that educational policy was really important. More recent educational policy, federal intervention into schools, is tied to a history of race and racism within local communities where the federal government intervenes in order to preserve the quality of schools and to generate greater, greater racial equality, um, which some local communities had no um, uh, commitment to. This setting of like national school-based policy is not just a, it's not a liberal conservative thing. Conservatives are deeply involved in create, using the federal government to create national school policies. But despite the growing federal influence um, on educational policy, that is, the, despite the growing influence of Washington, D.C. politicians on local schools, we still see a dramatic um, a, a, a dynamic of funding for schools, where schools are primarily funded from local and state, um, so local municipalities and states. Uh, like you know, the state of Massachusetts or the state of Nebraska or the state of Florida um, or the state of Oregon. Um, so different states provide funding and then different local municipalities provide funding for school. And here you'll see that 45% of school funding comes from the local community on average. And so the vast majority of funds still come from local communities for their schools. Um, and this uh, form of funding is really important because states also contribute vastly different proportions of money to their, their local schools. Some states contribute around 46%, but in Vermont, local municipalities pay very little for schooling, and the state pays for 90% of all the schoolings, whereas in South Dakota or Illinois, the state provides very little. Why does this matter? Why am I spending so much time talking about who pays for schools? Well, it matters for a range of reasons. Um, if local communities are paying for schools, how are they gonna interact with those schools? Also, how are they gonna interact with their local ordinances about who can live in their community? Wealthier communities are going to have more money to dedicate to their schools. They're gonna generate more resources through property taxes, for example, in order to support people, younger people, um, in their communities through education. This can create inequalities. It can create important inequalities in a society by providing greater degrees of funding for those local um, schools that happen to be in richer neighborhoods. And those richer neighborhoods may have interests in segregated schools if they don't want poor people around or they don't want um, people of color around. And so this local control of school has, has deep impacts on the ways in which American communities and neighborhoods are um, managed, experienced, and understood. Testing. Um, in particular, testing from the No Child Left Behind Act has had also a major impact on public education because increasingly um, in the United States, and we see this abroad as well um, in many contexts, constantly evaluating schools and children's performances who are from particular schools has become a, a, a critical task of the federal government and has used um, testing as a way to see, are we really serving low-income students well? Are we serving students of color well? And can we use some set of standardized tests to evaluate school performance critically in order to identify schools that may not be providing the best opportunities for students and then to intervene within those schools? Um, uh, you know, the No Child Left Behind Act, which was passed in 2001, basically wanted testing and accountability to be central to what it is that schools um, uh, should be doing. 
In addition, school choice has become a major um, um, a mantra and, 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 and part of the educational landscape. And here you just see the number of charter schools um, uh, uh, that exist in the United States. And charter schools are sort of are, uh, schools that compete with public schools, often for public funding, um, where they have greater degrees of autonomy about the sets of rules um, uh, uh, and ways that they educate people. And the idea here is to create greater competition in the educational environment and that that will create better performing schools. So if you just have one local public school, that local public school doesn't have any incentive to perform better because there aren't other competing schools around it that may put pressure on the school to increase its school quality. This is part of, in the United States, our often obsession with choice and competition, and the idea that choice and competition are going to lead to better degrees of quality. And as we see from this graph, in you know, basically the last 20 years, we've gone from having fewer than 500 charter schools to over 3,000, um, and so a six-fold increase. And this movement of school choice, or primarily tied to charter schools, has been deeply informed by the private sector, or a logic of capitalism, that says that competition is going to improve quality. Um, and that um, local schools and charter schools will all be better off if um, uh, uh, um, there's a competitive landscape for schools. Charter schools themselves are public schools um, and, um, uh, and open to all students. Um, and they typically have some standard for getting into them, um, uh, uh, but they are overall open. They're, controversial um, in the United States landscape. And I'll just say that from my perspective, and this is based on some of the literature that I've read on this, um, uh, charter schools don't really improve school, children's school performance. Um, and there's right now no real strong evidence that charter schools perform any better than public schools. Um, and uh, one of the things that they do is they often, when students don't perform well in charter schools, they kick them out and they send them to the public school. And so um, uh, uh, it's sort of unclear to me what the, the value of this, but it's, as you can see, an increasing aspect of the terrain of an American educational experience we can read this again through some of the theories that we were introduced to earlier, where we could see how this charter school movement is part of, kind of, if we think functionally, like it's, it's helping us think about what are the values of our society and how are those reflected in our school? And some of our values in American society are competition and choice. And the educational landscape is beginning to reflect that in the ways in which schools are structured. In terms of fixing schools, um, as I said um, before, I think that there are uh, uh, a few basic challenges to fixing schools. Um, one of them is that people often don't pay attention to the schools themselves. They have big ideas, but they don't actually know what it's like to be a teacher. The experience of being in a school, particularly a high poverty school, is like. Over the last decade, schools and districts across the country, especially those serving poorer students, have sort of been implementing one reform after another. They're constantly being subject to reforms and new ways of teaching. And some of these have had positive impacts, like smaller classes and uh, better qualified staff. That has definitely been beneficial to poorer. Others, like, have, most of them largely have failed. And I think that, like, you know, um, uh, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, um, uh, one of the reasons why schools tend not to 
seem to be impervious to social change is because changing the schools without changing the broader set of social conditions is just very unlikely to be successful. When I describe schools as magical institutions, the idea was that they're not. They're not actually magical places that can make all of the problems of a society go away. And instead of focusing on schools as the producers of those problems, what if we thought about schools as places that reflect the problems? And that in order to address them, what we have to address is not just the schools, but the poverty. So that the problem of poor students in schools is not a school problem, it's a poor problem. The problem of racism in schools is partially a problem of racism within the institution of schools, but much more broadly, it's a problem of racism within a society. And so we need to think about more directly addressing the sets of things that are associated with achievement or opportunity gaps in schools. And you know, my personal position is that addressing those will both help with a bunch of other problems and help moderate some of the issues that we see in terms of opportunity gaps in schools today. And so that's the final lecture on schools.